Thanks for having me and uh, thanks for organizing this. Am I the first remote speaker? Was Christian? Um, just want to say, I wish I was there in person, I guess. But um, the part of me that thinks there's no pandemic wishes, I guess. But uh, I'm probably also one of the few people that are in a colder location right now. So, wow. Okay. So uh, what I want to talk about today is a um, project with Andy Mannion and Mike Wong um, that relates um, some stuff from Hager floor homology with some stuff from representation theory. Um, so we're going to talk about um, an annular result. So maybe I'm going to start with some motivation of um, why would one want to ask the questions we asked. Um, and I guess the usual motivation in my world is, well, okay, so I'm a knot theorist. And so we have these two um, familiar knot polynomials, the Jones and the Alexander polynomial, whose um, categorifications we know are Kovanov and um, knot floor homology, right? And um, they're much stronger in variance. They're awesome. Uh, we know various things about how they relate to each other. And yet, now they're, they're defined in two very, very different ways, right? Kovanov homology, it's an algebraic construction. It comes from representation theory and then link floor or not floor homology. Well, it's a, it's a floor theory. And so the construction is just um, inherently analytic. So, and yet so much is known about, I mean, so much is still unknown about how they relate to each other as well. Um, and so, okay, how, would you think about connecting these two worlds? One possibility is let's look downstairs and uh, let me just reshare my screen because my highlighter is not showing up. So there we go. Um, if at any point it looks like I'm yapping about something and it's unclear what it is and you think it might be that my screen is not updating when I'm pointing on it, just unmute and give a shout because uh, I think this will happen. It's been ongoing for over a week for with my tablet, I don't know why. So, okay, so I want to look downstairs and say um, one thing we know the Jones and Alexander polynomial have in common is they both can be seen as examples of um, this general TQFT um, approach to constructing link polynomials uh, originating all the way back from the 80s. Um, and so here's the general idea. I think we've all seen this at some point, um, some of us more often than others. But here's the general idea. So suppose you have a link and fix a quantum group you might be interested in and fix a representation of that quantum group and take your link and slice it into elementary pieces um, like that. And once you've decomposed it, associate to the cuts to the places where you sliced tensor products of representations um, or of your chosen representation or its dual, depending which way your knot is going. And to the pieces of tangles, to the elementary pieces, crossings, cups, and caps, you associate certain maps of, um, well, vector spaces, if you don't want to think about representations, but really um, maps on the representations. OK, so do that and compose all the maps. So if you have a closed link, you're gonna start all the way from having nothing. So um, say that your ground ring is uh, C of Q and you're gonna wind up with nothing. And so if you constructed this in an intelligent way, you're gonna get a link invariant, right? So you're gonna want some maps that respect right to moves and so on. And so you're gonna get a link invariant and you're gonna check where does it send the uh, unit one, it sends it to some polynomial that's your invariant. And so that's one way to construct the Alexander and Jones polynomial both. Uh, Jones polynomial, you're going to look at SL2 and you're going to take your standard two-dimensional vector representation. And for the Alexander polynomial, we're going to start with GL11 and take its standard uh, vector representation um, sort of modulo a little bit of 
there's a technical difference there, but we're not going to touch on that. So if you know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Um, but all right, so this is old stuff. And a general goal from there is you want to categorify this construction. Um, what do I really mean by that? Well, in general, if you have vector spaces, you, you're going to want to replace them with categories and you're going to want to replace your linear maps with functors. All right. So maybe focusing on SL2, this was done for Kovanov homology a, a while back, very soon after Kovanov homology was defined. Um, so there's a similar invariant for tangles, whereas not floor homology originally was defined in a global way. So you need to have a complete knot together with a certain uh, Morse function on your manifold that um, respects the knot in a certain way, and then it's a global construction. Um, since we're online, I just want to pause for a second and check if, am I speaking loud enough or too loud, too fast, too, uh, the accent we cannot fix, so you're stuck with that part. Um, is the writing good enough? No, I think so. I could be zooming if needed. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so maybe this is a sort of background um, motivation for, for the story. So I'm backing up quite a bit. All right, so let's address this. This is a very big, very general kind of goal. This is not how it works. So let's grab an example. Let's look at uh, maybe GL11. Um, okay, so we want to have a knot floor theory for tangles. And this was work we did a while back with Vera Vertici, and since then, a uh, bunch of other tango invariants have come to life. Um, and if I start saying names, I might miss some, but uh, Oshvat and Sabo have a uh, different construction. Um, Claudio Zubrovius has um, an invariant for tangles that's also floor motivated and so on. So I'm just going to here lay out one of these. So. The idea is now we have a tangle, so you have a link with boundary. Well, you have a cobordism from maybe a set of points to a set of points. And um, we do have an oriented invariant, but I just want to keep notation very simple for the purposes of today. So I'm going to strip off a lot of the, the actual notation from here. So what we did is if you have a sequence of points, we associate to that a differential graded algebra. <laughs> So let's just keep it simple and say some algebra, some DGA A sub M if you got M points. Okay, but they can have signs. And so if you have a tangle thought of as a one dimensional cobordism, then to that we associate um, differential graded bimodule over the two DGAs. Okay. And so that construction uses bordered floor theory. So I'm going to say a few words about it in a moment. I just maybe want to state first uh, result or what do we get? We get something that's an invariant of the tango. We get something that um, concatenates properly. So uh, composing two tangles corresponds to taking a derived tensor product of the corresponding bimodules. And of course, what was the motivation for that? We wanted to have a cut and paste way of studying not floor homology. And so indeed, um, if your tango is a closed link, we recover. Um, and so I think some of you could be irritated. One of my collaborators, Mike Wong, he doesn't like when I keep switching between saying not floor and link floor homology. So I apologize if my language offends you, but okay, link floor homology. Um, we recover that. So let me just pause for a second and kind of verbally mention a couple of disclaimers or clarifications here. So when I'm saying we get an invariant, if you're familiar with link floor homology, uh, you may know that there's multiple flavors it comes in. Um, one is the tilde flavor that avoids a bunch of uh, base points on a Hager diagram. And so this is the one I'm gonna talk about today. So that is, uh, we have approved that that is a link invariant modulo the number of base points you use. And then there's a more complicated, uh, you know, a more sophisticated maybe version, the minus version. And so maybe for now it's only conjecturally an invariant, although um, I think my student has made some good combinatorial progress on proving this. 
So, okay, what else did I want to mention? This um, bi module comes with various gradings on it that I'm not going to discuss for the rest of today. But that's about it. Okay, so let me say a few words about how we define this. So we start with, uh, well, first you're gonna wanna be able to represent a tangle with a Hager diagram. And so we're gonna use a bordered Hager diagram to represent a tangle. So um, think of you have some sort of relative Morse function going on. Um, you're gonna count holomorphic curves in the product of your Hager surface, cross I cross R with certain asymptotics. And since we have a combinatorial construction, I'm not really gonna focus on that, but I still wanna say where this comes from or just kinda what are the ingredients that help us have that um, construction work out. And it all started in, well, maybe it all started in the 2000s, but it all started with um, work of Lipschitz in which he reformulated the definition of the closed invariance for Hager floor homology from working in a higher symmetric product of the surface to working in this four dimensional setup. And so that opened the door to um, develop border floor homology, a uh, theory for manifold with boundary defined by Lipschitz, Oshvald and Thurston, um, which we basically uh, took with Vera to this next level of let's do tangles. All right. So without going too much into the detail of how this construction works, I'm just gonna give a couple of glimpses of, hey, here's a picture of how you can see a tangle from a border diagram. And here's some examples of what the, your bimodule counts. Um, okay, so we said it's gonna be a bimodule over a, a differential graded algebra for the boundaries of the tango. And so um, how we're gonna see that is as you count your holomorphic curves, if you have curves that interact in a certain way, interact with the boundary of a surface, that data is gonna be recorded by uh, an action of the algebra. So just a little um, example by picture here, and we're about to dig into that just a little more. So, okay, um, if we have, a, we have a lot of people that are maybe more from the algebraic side of things and not from a Hager floor background, so, Let's just do a little bit of translation by picture here. So first, a bordered Hager diagram, I'm only gonna show that a couple of more times throughout the talk, is maybe think of it as some combinatorial picture with some uh, red and blue curves on it. This stopped sharing again. Okay. Um, and so how you can rebuild your tango from, from that is, so here's a bunch of X's and O's, and we're gonna to wanna to connect O's to X's, X's to O's, all that stuff away from the blue curves once. So whenever you can, and you're also gonna to wanna to be doing that away from the red curves. So think of it as a combinatorial game if you wish. And um, when you're connecting away from the blues, you're gonna draw those arcs a little above the remaining arcs. And so somehow you get yourself a tango. Let's uh, straighten it up a little bit for convenience so you can see better. Okay. Um, just a couple of words of what is this bimodule? It's generated by certain intersection points of blues and reds on your diagram. And it's um, differential is going to count certain rectangles on the diagram that sort of connect sets of intersection points. So if you can interpolate from one choice, maybe these white dots here to another, the yellow dots, so that they only differ by, I guess, a rectangle, then this is gonna correspond to a piece of the differential. And if you have rectangles with boundary, that's gonna be recorded with some sort of algebraic action. Um, I don't plan to do any concrete examples that require you to uh, require anyone to have actually, you know, followed any of that or made sense of this correspondence of pictures I'm showing, but do feel free to pause me and ask a few more questions if you like. So I think the takeaways, here's some pictures. Uh, if you black box the actual definitions, I hope you should be fine. 
Okay, um, maybe, maybe it's kind of fun to say what the algebra looks like. And um, all right, the algebra looks like some sort of strand diagrams that record if you're counting something that uh, interacts with the boundary, well, what pieces of the boundary do you see out there? So here I see something that goes from um, a red curve of height one to a red curve of height three. Uh, and of course I've screwed up the picture, but oh well. Um, let's see, this is how we do this. Fix the picture. There you go. Um, and so you record that with a strand diagram. The differential on the algebra smooths crossings on strands and multiplication just sticks diagrams together if that's possible. And then you quotient by certain relations. So you don't wanna see double crossings, stuff like that. Um, if you've seen similar stuff for SL2 or if you've seen um, talks on border floor homology, this, this could look sort of familiar. Okay. So here's an example. Um, I think it may be hard to see on a screen, but you have a bunch of white dots that I'm about to highlight. Highlight. And so this represents, this set of dots represents, um, let's not do the last one, represents a generator of your bimodule. And so this is who I'm gonna call X. And so one example of algebra multiplication is that we look at this half rectangle that uh, touches the boundary, we multiply it by whatever algebra element corresponds to seeing this. And we get that X times this algebra element gives you this other generator Y that's obtained from X by switching from this dot that I'm pointing at to this other dot above it. Just a little example. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so um, I've promised quantum J11, so let's get to it. So, okay, so you have this and it's a global invariant and it's a local way to study not floor homology. So maybe the next natural goal is let's take this construction and relate it to, um, I mean, I guess, for example, to the world of Kovanov homology for tangles, right? And so what, what we wanna do, the first step is Let's fit this into the Reshitik and Turaev um, framework for you know, construction for J11. So where does this J11 come into play? Okay, and so this is uh, also slightly older work with Ellis and Vertishim. Um, so we roughly show, I mean, this is, this is a funny sounding statement but we show the tangle floor homology categorifies this Reshitik and Turaev invariant. In other words, you know, we do soup up the linear maps with bimodules and so on and so on. Um, roughly, we show that the growth in D group for um, our DGAs has a basis given by certain very special, very uh, basic looking modules. Um, and, and I don't want to say a whole lot about it, but maybe let's just say, remember we have a tangle and its boundary is a sequence of points. That sequence of points is gonna correspond to once again, uh, that product of representations. <laughs> and um, maybe let me go to, all right. So let me go to this slide here. So we basically show that um, computing growth in the group, you do get exactly that. And kind of like taking all the characteristics of your bimodule, you get your Reshtik and Turaev invariant by just working out this correspondence very carefully. So, I mean, for now, you've just shown that you have something that decategorifies to those linear maps. So where you really start seeing the quantum group structure is you got to do a little more work now. So we, what we did is we constructed um, bimodules on the category of modules over the DGA for a bunch of points that correspond to the action of certain elements of quantum J11 on 
the tensor product of representations. Okay, a little bit too much black box stuff. So maybe what I wanna do is um, let's lay out a couple of almost definitions. Mm -hmm. So without a full definition, let's just recall quantum J11 is generated by some special elements E, F, and um, a bunch of Qs that we're not gonna think about. So their action is gonna be very simple in our case, uh, module certain relations, <laughs> okay? Um, and these relations, I've laid out the ones I wanna care about below here. So in the downstairs world, we have E square is zero, for example, F square is zero, uh, EF plus FE is one, someone might frown at this. Um, so for the tangles that we study, we always sort of correct. I mean, it just ends up like that, that you always end up getting a representation for whatever tensor product of, well, suppose you have a tangle that's oriented, suppose you have a braid, okay. And so you kind of have this one dimensional or well, two dimensional representation that corrects a little bit for, for the weight that you end up getting. So you wind up with something that's just weight one. And so you really get a genuine one there just because of uh, by virtue of what representation we end up getting. Okay, ENF commute with the um, rest chicken to F invariant. And so what you wanna show is you wanna get these bimodules upstairs and you want to show similar, similar kind of equivariance and you want to show lifts of the, the other relations that you have. And so we do that. Um, and I'm going to keep this very vague for another few minutes as I would like to jump to well, what is, so what are we doing with Andy and, and Mike now? So we kind of exhibit the existence of two morphisms that categorify the relations downstairs. And, and I guess what's the next natural step is you wanna compute these two morphisms a little more carefully, understand them better. And after doing that, could you maybe use that work to get some sort of J11 action on link floor homology? This is the wishful thinking at that stage of the process. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of a very general question, but could we have that? Um, well, the answer is, I don't know. Could we have an exciting J11 action on link flow homology? But maybe a question that could be answered is, all right, let's back off a little bit and let's do this in the annular setting. And it turns out that, yes, we do have something going on there. Um, so maybe similar work to compare with is annular sutured Kobano homology and um, which carries an SL2 ac action by work of Grigsby, Licata, and Verley. So is Rob, Robert here? Well, so this was, this was a question that Robert raised. He, once we got the tango floor invariant done, he kind of said, well, we should look into this and at least figure this part out. And uh, thank you, Robert. Sorry, it took a while. So there we are. Okay, so what do I mean by annular setting now? Um, in our case, again, we have this two category where we have objects of it are DGAs and the one morphisms are the bimodules. And so, okay, your two morphisms are gonna be bimodule homomorphisms. And then you can apply the Hochschild functor to this to get, all right, uh, chain complexes from your one morphisms and maps on those from the two morphisms. And specializing to tango floor homology, maybe let's take homology just to state a simpler result, is if you take Hochschild homology of our tango floor bimodule, the homology we get is actually the link floor homology of the closure of the tango if you glue it to itself, um, except that you also end up recording, you end up recovering the information of uh, this axis that binds it. Say if it was a braid, you would call it the braid axis. So I'm gonna call it the tango axis. So we get the link floor homology for that. Um, if you prefer this notation, I'm gonna call it the annular link floor homology of the closure of the tango. Cool. 
So on the one hand, we have uh, started fitting in Tango floor homology with uh, GL11. On the other hand, we have the self gluing result. And so let's start putting the two together a little bit. So this is where we stand. Um, saying in progress, a lot of this is worked out and written up already, but um, maybe full disclaimer. So what we show with Andy and Mike is Recall we have these bimodules um, from earlier, E and F, let's call them curly E and F. We showed that they induce chain maps on the link floor homology of the closed tangle together with its axis, so that these chain maps satisfy the following relations, essentially J11 relations. So E square is zero, little f square is zero, EF plus FE is uh, the identity map and hmm, maybe on homology. And ENF commute with the candidate tangle cobordism maps. So why am I saying candidate? Because uh, that's, let me just give me a second and I'll explain, but we do not have yet a well-developed theory, but uh, all things point to this is gonna work out fine. Um, and so the idea of the, of the proof of that slash the construction that we do is we're gonna use a construction on by categories known as horizontal trace. And I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Uh, more excitingly, maybe from the perspective of a Hager floor theorist is that it turns out that these actions, uh, the chain maps on link floor homology we get correspond to certain combinatorial base point actions. Uh, so you have a Hager diagram for the closure of the tangle and you have certain uh, base points, one, two, three, four different base points on the tangle axis. And two of these base points counting um, certain curves that pass through them turns out to be uh, equivalent to recording the little e and the little f action. And I will, if this sounds kind of vague, I will show a more explicit picture in a little bit as well. Okay, so a couple of disclaimers in uh, bright pink is, um, first of all, we don't quite have a bi category. Um, we have, I guess what we have is a sesqui category. So we don't have the interchange law doesn't quite hold. It holds up to homotopy in the setting of uh, bordered floor theory, okay? But this is good enough for us to follow um, familiar recipe coming from horizontal trace to uh, get our result. A second disclaimer is, well, um, there is at this time, there is no invariance um, proven for, so if you have a tangle cobordism that induces a bimodule homomorphism on tangle floor homology, and um, we haven't worked out invariance for those. Okay. I pause again, any questions? Uh, well, maybe one question. So you, okay, so as you said, it's just candidate tangle cobalt map, but still you, you, you would be in this annular, in this annular setting, right? Mm -hmm. You don't expect to have many of this cobaltism, right? Right, and so some of them also you could kind of diagrammatically see very explicitly like um, maybe crossing changes and stuff like that, like some sort of scale moves and everything points to, I mean, for those that you kind of know how to describe, um, you can sort of see that the actions of ENF commute with those. It's just like, you know, there's details to be worked out to be able to say things properly. And it's also, I gotta say really weird too. I don't know where you're talking from, but the video I'm seeing of you is muted and yet you're getting animated and you're moving and the sound is coming through. Okay. Um, and so we're not quite gonna fit in this quite properly, but again, we're gonna, we're gonna get a little more concrete and things are gonna work out for us. Um, still for just sort of, um, I guess, um, 
cultural enrichment or just to lay things out properly to begin with, um, what is a horizontal trace? So I think this definition goes back to Anna, uh, to Belakova, Habirola, and Zivkovic from 14-ish. So suppose you have a by category, uh, you get from that another category called the horizontal trace of C. The objects of the new category are the endomorphisms, the one endomorphisms of your original category C. The morphisms of your new category, you sort of get them from the two morphisms on C. So, um, except you might have a two morphism that goes from um, kind of starting with the wrong uh, DGA in our case to the wrong DGA. So you have classes of P sigma where P might be a one morphism from X to Y and then sigma is a two morphism from um, composition of P of F to the composition G of P. So that you end up getting a two morphism that uh, connects one morphisms from, you know, starting from the same X and ending the same Y. <laughs> Module of certain relations, and I've kind of laid this out here, but um, we're not gonna quite go there. And we're gonna specialize a little bit to chain complexes in a moment. So maybe let's just say that from the one endomorphisms, you get objects, from the two morphisms, you kind of get morphisms of the new category. and you want to have some carefully designed relations so that this makes sense. Um, however, okay, maybe a way to visualize this is, all right, I could think of a one endomorphism as a circle. This is just very silly, kind of like, here's a graphical doodly way to think of this construction. And then let's actually um, make this a little more concrete and make sense of it, all right. But so horizontal trace, um, I can think of the objects as morphisms f from x to x, and let's just represent that by a circle. And the morphisms of horizontal trace, I could think of these pairs, remember? P comma sigma, graphically. And so I could think of those as maybe a doodle on a cylinder. So this is just, again, very bizarre maybe for now, but here's a two morphism sigma. And you've started with an F and you've ended with a G and you have this kind of auxiliary P for your construction, okay? Um, all right, somewhat weird. So what the hell should this picture really, really stand for? Why am I drawing it this way? Well, so it turns out if your one morphisms, if this one morphism P here in this pair has a left dual, then we can think of the cup and the cap in the doodle as actual evaluation and co-evaluations. And so as I really breeze through that horizontal trace idea, let's just specialize to the setting where maybe we do have that and see what we get. Um, okay, so just a quick kind of, here's my portion of Wikipedia, so to say, what is the left dual of something of um, a one morphism, it's another one so that certain adjunction um, laws hold, okay? So I'm sorry that I keep blinking on you, but the highlighter stops working. So what are the adjunction rules? Well, you have maps from F composed with F dual to the identity. You have a map from the identity to F dual composed with F. Um, so that if graphically you think of these two maps, the so-called epsilon and eta here as cups and caps, then um, if you compose them the two possible ways, you still get the identity. Identity for F and identity for F dual, okay. So suppose you have that, what you can do is um, think a little more concretely um, and from your horizontal trace, you can get a map to uh, chain complexes by composing a bunch of maps together. So say that you're interested in this two morphism sigma. Um, and say you're starting with your one morphism F. So um, you can take Hochschild, uh, you, you can take Hochschild chain complex and then um, respectively for the maps as well, 
I didn't have space, so I just kind of parenthesized them. But everywhere you should think CH, all right? And so you can compose a bunch of these maps. So eta from the adjunction together with identity on F. Then you can compose with um, your given two morphism sigma. Then what you can do is you have taken Hochschild, uh, you, you have taken CH star, so you can kind of rotate things around. And so you have the duo of uh, whoever you started with and you can slide around and then you can compose with um, epsilon to get back to identity. My highlighter stopped working again. So here's your epsilon and you wind up with G, right? So G was the target of sigma. GFP was the target of sigma rather. Okay, and so you can compose these few maps and, and that gives you a well-defined map to um, chain complexes. So starting with Hochschild of F, you get to Hochschild of G. Okay, so this is the idea that you wanna follow. And now let's apply this to our setting. What do I mean by that? So first order of business, do we have duals of the structures that we care about? Turns out that we do have adjoint duals, whatever. Um, so the E and F pi modules that we define with Ellis and Vertici, yeah, indeed we have, they have duals. And um, proof slash how do we know that is just we explicitly construct them. So they do have Hager diagrammatic descriptions, so maybe that's best to draw. Um, if you are one of the listeners that has some um, familiarity with border floor homology, Let's just say that they kind of your Hager diagrams look very similar to ones for the identity one morphisms, um, except they have a little bit of a something added on. So they have one handles added on here and there. Okay. Um, if you like strand diagrams better, then think that you almost have strand diagrams for the identity, except there's these um, weight shifting strands that are included in. <laughs> Okay, and so basically we have these explicit pictures that give us the bimodules. And so we work out strand diagrammatic definitions of the complete structure on them. And diagrammatically as well, we define the maps that we need, eta and epsilon, and prove the adjunctions. Okay. So. Here's like a little visual example to the bottom right of eta for um, the module E. And so with these four bi modules in mind, we show that they induce four different chain maps, E, F, I guess um, what's left, left duo of F and right duo of E on link floor homology. So that, um, for example, the relations on E and F that I cleaned hold and so on. And just maybe a glimpse of the proof. So we had stated with um, Ellis and Vertici that we have these relations that categorify the J11 relations for E and F. And so what you wanna do is you wanna compute them. You wanna understand them a little better. For example, um, remember that E commutes with uh, the Reshetikin to Reif invariant. Um, and so you have a home top equivalence from the bimodule E tensor tangle floor homology of a tangle to the tangle floor homology uh, bimodule of the tangle tensor E. Well, what is this homotopy equivalence? It actually comes from a handle slide on a Hager diagram. And so you wanna understand the uh, induced map explicitly. That's one example of something you're hands-on computing. And once you have that, what do you do? Let's grab that example. So that equivalence is given by a map by two morphism alpha E, right? That's a bimodule homomorphism and apply this, um, cylindrical computation to it, so to say. 
right? So we have these eta and epsilon maps explicitly for E and its dual. So we've defined them, we understand them. Uh, we also have alpha, the bimodule homomorphism for commuting with E, compose everything and compute it carefully. And so that is what composes to give you little e, your chain map on link floor homology for um, the closure of the tangle. Okay. And then once you've done that, you want to ask again, well, I mean, we have Hager diagrams, but we've defined everything strand diagrammatically, um, combinatorially in order to prove things better. Um, so what should this correspond to? And it turns out that, yeah, these actions, um, they do correspond to base point actions by um, the four base points for the tango axis. So um, let me show this with a picture since I never defined really anything very carefully. Um, but so, for example, this relation EF plus FE is one um, corresponds to the fact that if you count, like, say you have some link and say you have some two nearby base points on a Hager diagram for that link. Uh, if you look at the part of the differential that crosses the one point or the other, you have a similar relation. DZ DW plus DW DZ is homotopic to the identity. Um, one place that I've seen this kind of laid out stated is in uh, Baldwin, Levin and Sharkar's paper on pointed links. So maybe here's a kind of proof by picture slash explanation by picture, a little bit of what we've talked about. So um, maybe blank box, but suppose you have here a Hager diagram for a tangle running from left to right. Um, First of all, how do we show that the Hochschild homology of tangle floor homology is link floor homology for your thing with its axis? It's a Hager diagrammatic proof. It's um, cut your diagram open at the top and bottom, right? It kind of looked like a tube. Cut it open at the top and bottom. Glue the left and right edges together. I mean, Hochschild homology is sort of like an algebraic gluing of left and right actions in a sense, right? So glue these together and they had been cut. So think about you have glued the left and right edges and you have this entire arc here collapse. This entire arc becomes a circle, collapse it to get a base point. And let me call it Z1 in this picture. All right. And somehow what you get is a Hager diagram for the correct thing. You get a Hager diagram for T together with its axis. Okay. Um, and so proof by picture, it turns out that um, this entire sequence of, let me go back for a second, of maps that we wanted to compute, each of these individual maps corresponds to something being counted on your Hager diagram, okay? And I guess this is impossible to follow really if you don't uh, look at my previous slide, but I've encoded that sequence of maps with kind of shading pieces of a diagram here. And so that sequence of maps actually counts a sequence of certain polygons on your diagram. That's the idea of the proof. So the maps are diagrammatically defined. They compose to give you little e. Um, their count corresponds to counting certain polygons on your Hager diagram and um, so if you find a way to encode everything together on one and the same diagram and count, you have your proof. Um, and here's the proof. There's some sort of bijection of, of Hager diagrams and bijection of polygons. So in a sense, thinking of composing the few different maps that compute your action, turns out to correspond bijectively to counting um, things on the Hager diagram for, so this is the Hager diagram for the closure of T union, the axis. And so you're counting polygons that cross a given base point. And this given base point um, corresponds to this um, axis, I guess. Um, all right, so maybe. I ask the question. So you basically yeah. think that you add uh, the axis as an uh, unknot, yeah? going around your, so you, you have your diagram? Yeah, let's draw a picture maybe. 
Sure. Um, uh, keep talking. Uh, so the question is, uh, so taking Hochschild homology of the tangle homology just the same as uh, normal uh, Higgin floor of this link where you have the original ones in horizontal uh, annulus and like uh, just, just one component. Yeah, so taking Hochschild homology of... Guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of this guy, I mean, cut it open at this, um, cut open at this disc here, and that's your tangle. So CH star of the bimodule for the tangle is homotopy equivalent to link floor homology of this entire picture of green together with uh, pink. Did you say something again? Because it got quiet. For Kovanov, it's not true, yeah? So the annular Kovanov homology, it's uh -huh. just a normal one for this link. Yeah, yeah, true, fair. Um, I think Rosansky some, did something in this direction recently, but I'm not sure. I remember seeing in this, um, when Tony, Ellie, and Stefan wrote there, um, Shurval representations paper. I remember seeing, so the annular sutured Kovanov homology there, they were conjecturing, it. They, they said this might be the Hochschild homology of some map, but it's unknown. So was that disproven later or is that still? Oh, so, so this is correct. If you compute Hochschild homology of this R algebras, you get annular Kovanov homology. But I think the question was that Annular Kovanov homology is not Kovanov homology of right. the node with an component. Fair enough. Yeah, correct. Um, well, all right. And so, whatever this creature is, I'm like kind of calling it annular link floor homology. I don't know if that's even a fair word. Is uh, Does someone have an opinion here? Anyway, but but this is what you get. So this is a fact, fact theorem, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. Maybe something to do is um, I like combinatorially, algebraically, explicitly defined things, but maybe a uh, question mark is. Is this actually corresponding to the correct holomorphic counts? Um, one should be able to show that, but we don't know this at the moment. And so maybe this is a good place to stop. Is there any questions either from here or from Zoom? Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hina. Hi, uh, So, uh, if I remember correctly, the annular, the G, the SL2 action on annular Kovanov homology uh, was an ingredient of uh, Baldwin Seebeck's proof that Kovanov homology detects the T25 uh, knot. Okay. And they used it to derive some uh, rank inequalities between various uh, various groups wow. of Kovanov homology. And they say at some point in the end of the paper that that, that strategy could work on for Higgel Fleur if they if a bunch of things were true and among them I think there was something related to uh, annular not Fleur homology. So, so have you think of applying this to that? Or? No. So I think I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my hmm, filter, what I'm going to say. Not out of my mouth for, for the moment, but I think I haven't looked at their, how they do that stuff. But I think the point is that they use SL2. And so you have those EF plus FE relations look a little different. Um, they get like a two-dimensional thing. It equals like a H plus or 2H or something. So I think with when you have an SL2 action, it's kind of 
very clear how you use that to deduce various rank inequalities. And I don't think this pans out the same way with J11. So maybe I, I'm guessing, is it possible that they're saying, oh, wouldn't it be really cool to have an SL2 action on link floor homology and then you can do all, um, that sort of stuff with that? I think, so I'll look into that. Can someone help me out here? Does that sound about right or? Uh, yeah, I actually talked to John Baldwin about this recently, and that's exactly his understanding. Okay. Yes, that the GL11 action would have held the same way. So he doesn't know if an SL2 action would exist. Wait, the GL11 action would or would, would not? not? Would not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So that was my understanding. Well, I am, uh, so since uh, since somehow you uh, put away the, ge the geometry, so would it, do you think it would, uh, well, the kind of techniques you use would be, uh, well, would could be transformed to define something speaking about GL1N or GL22 or other super quantum blah, blah? Yeah. That'd be nice, right? Um, I don't have anything concrete to say. I mean, it's a it's a difficult world, so we have what we have, and yeah, I think that's always the wishful thinking. You just kind of start drawing from ideas in in one setup, and how much can I push it? Can I modify it? Can I uh, generalize things? But I don't have anything concrete to give you right now. Um, hopefully, someone figures something out over time. Okay, well, if uh, there is no more question, uh, let us thank uh, Ina again.